Um, okay. So welcome to our first education session. Um, I know it took us a while to get started, but hopefully uh, to those of you in person and those people watching the recording, this is helpful and um, you get something beneficial out of this. So today we're going to be talking about communication interfaces. So basically, how do you get printed circuit boards to talk to each other? How do you get integrated circuits to talk to each other? And really systems at a more general level. Um, so jumping right in, why do we even care about this? Um, companies love to ask interview questions about these communication interfaces because really at their base level, everything needs to talk to something else. If you want two boards or chips or systems to talk to each other, you need communication. And honestly, to be frank, systems that don't talk to each other are kind of lame because you really don't have that much information if they can't talk to other systems and get information from them, um, right? Like Data Logger, one of the coolest projects, in my opinion, on the car is the epitome of this. Like it needs to know the data from every single board on the car and every sensor, and it uses all of that, logs it, and that information is the most vital thing to us making a better car the next time we go through the design cycle. So information is just really important. Um, as well as every bus that we're about to talk about is somewhere on the car. Um, if I tried to make that apparent in the slides, um, if it's not apparent where one of the buses is when I describe it, please let me know and I'll make sure to cover that more in depth. Um, so you will likely run into all of these at some point. So the first one is the UART. So that's Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. Um, the asynchronous means that it doesn't have a clock line. So there's nothing standardizing the communication. Um, all UART devices have two wires, one to transmit and one to receive information, and that'll be flipped on the other side. So one side will be transmitting, and that goes into the, one side is transmitting, that goes into the other side's receive, and then this side's receive is going into the other one's, um, sorry, this one's transmit is going to the other one's receiver. Um, so normally you start with, transmit is pulled high um, and then you pull that low um, as you can see at the bottom I think this thing might be let me hide okay now your screen shouldn't be blocked um, so as you can see on the bottom that red part is how the bus normally is it's pulled high and then we pull that low in order to indicate the start of a transmission. And when I say pull that low, I mean there's a transistor um, basically connected to that bus and then also connected to ground. And it will short this bus to ground when you want to pull that low. So um, that will discharge. Um, this will be the pulling high and pulling low idea will become a bit more apparent as we go through. Um, the next two after this. Um, but just trust me for now on that. I have some better diagrams after this to explain it. But for now, take my word that we pull it low, which basically brings it from like high, like VDD down to ground. Um, and that indicates the start of a message. And then after that, you can send like high for one, low for zero, uh, and up and down. Now, one thing that's significant about this is that the data length and the speed that you're sending data, and speed is also called the baud rate, those need to be agreed upon before you start using this bus. So that's done in the firmware for either the microcontroller and then typically your chip on its data sheet um, if you're not using a microcontroller uh, on both sides, like one side's a chip. Typically, that will dictate what your baud rate is because that's sort of hardwired. Um, it's a little bit harder to change that. Typical baud rate, 
about uh, 9600 and what 9600 means is that each bit is one over 9600 so like 104 microseconds so basically since you don't have a clock this speed needs to be agreed upon and then you just like you wait 104 microseconds and then you take a reading and then you wait 104 microseconds and then you take a reading from after it's pulled low um and you sense around the middle of the bit and that's just so that you can you don't want to be too close to the rising edge or falling edge so you basically pull low it waits half of a baud and then it counts like one baud two baud three baud four baud um, this is a eight bit message so it counts to eight and then it senses each of those um and then on the other side since this is a uh, serial which means one at a time down the line as opposed to parallel where if we had like eight wires and we just sent all eight bits at the same time um it will take this serial information put into a buffer and then send that to memory um depending on what device you're using typically this is just two devices talking to each other because you have transmitter and receiver so usually it's just one-to-one -one communication um, and this communication is used when micro basic the uh, basically the STM32 building block that we use on all of our boards. This is used when MicroBasic is talking to your computer over serial. That's UART transmission. Um, so, I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, so that's where you would typically run into this. Um, I, know I, I know I went through that kind of quickly. Is there any questions on uh, sort of, I guess, any basics of the communication or specifically how this one uh works yeah andrew so i'm curious <clears throat> why would we choose um an asynchronous protocol over a synchronous one like why are we using um this one we're using a micro basic to talk to our laptop yeah um so I'll cover three buses right now, and then I'll go through which one you would use and why. Um, but I'll cover that a little bit now as well. Um, we use UART for the micro basic talking to your computer because you want the least number of wires coming out, right? So we have that like really small connector that goes into the uh, onto the micro basic, and what that does is it connects the ST-Link to the STM32 chip, right? And the ST-Link just uses serial communication. Um, like that's just what it's set up to use um, because it has, it's very simple to implement. It has very few wires and your baud rate is already agreed upon. Your data length is pretty standard. So really this is like the simplest and easiest to implement. So sometimes you opt for that simplicity um, just to get something that works more reliably. Okay, I also have one more question. So you're saying here that TX is always normally high, but when we pull it low, um, when we're starting a message. So are we like constantly checking TX or do we only like check when it gets pulled low? It's like pulling risk interrupts, right? Like how are we doing that for this? Yeah, so... um your UART transmitter and receiver is, um, it's a digital communication, yes, but typically the part that is reading the bus and then turns that into the uh, parallel bits to put that into memory, um, at least when I implemented it in like X151, that was an analog block. So it basically, you you'd basically just do circuitry that will be activated when that goes low so it's not like a microcontroller that's like constantly checking like hey is this low hey is this low hey is this low um the uart receiver like block of that microcontroller um will basically collect the serial transmission 
turn that into a data packet that you can send on chip. And then that can be, um, like that can be, what's the word? You can set the preference, like whether you want that to like do um, an interrupt or you want to pull that or you want to just do, like sometimes you can do a DMA, which is direct memory access. So if this was a sensor or something, you could just have it directly um, putting this information into memory. So um, that's sort of like beyond the UART receiver that's like on chip, um, whether you actually talking with on this UART bus and that would sort of determine how you want to set that up. Okay, but like what you're saying basically is that there is some analog circuitry in the micro basic or in the microcontroller chip that will get triggered when we pull when we pull it low. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the the analog circuitry is looking for that. And then when it gets pulled low, it will collect all of this data into a buffer. And then that buffer is what actually interfaces uh with the digital logic of the chip. All right. Wait, um, uh, so one question is, so does the data speed refer to like, if you pull it down, then that's like the speed at which it'll go through? Yeah, so the data speed is um, basically the length of each of these intervals so at the bottom, like this green interval is when I, that's basically called my start bit. So that's when I start the message. It's not information in the message, but it indicates the start. And then each of these um, bits at the bottom where it says like one, one, zero, zero of the whole message, each length of those is um, like if my baud rate was 9,600, each length of those is 104 microseconds. How would you know when the message is finished? Because there's a start bit, but there's no end bit. So how do you know like that red part at the end has started? Yeah, so um, data length is agreed upon before um, the bus is in use. So like on each side, my baud rate and my data rate, I'll input that. Um, so if you had to send more data, you would just send like more packets um you wouldn't make your message length longer so we know that's the end because we see it being high for a really long time but also we know that's the end because um like it we've already seen eight bits so we know we're done All right. Um, if there's nothing else, then I'll move on to our next one. So our next one is I2C. Um, I You can see I have a note here on the right. Some people sometimes call it I squared C. Um, and then if you're really crazy, you say IIC. I, I don't really ever hear anyone say IIC. Um, I personally prefer I2C, but I squared C is an equally valid name. Um, but other than that, uh, that stands for inter-integrated circuit. So that's typically what this communication protocol is used for. And it's made up of two lines, the SDA line and the SCL line. So this is a synchronous communication because our SCL, or basically clock, um, will be going up and down. And then SDA, or our data line, will be the one with our actual information on it. So something that's also different is UART is typically one device talking to another device. In this, we can have one main controller and then many peripherals. Um, 
sometimes these are referred to as a master device and slave devices. Um, but this language is problematic and in recent years um, has been slowly being resolved to be the controller and peripherals. So that's the language that um, we typically work with. So the I2C controller is the one that's actually driving this clock line. And then it will send um, an address on the data line and then a message. And one of the peripherals will read that depending on if it's that peripheral's address. And then the peripheral will, will either use that information or send some information back. Um, so typically this is used for intra PCB communication. So inside of one printed circuit board. And this is what's called a simplex communication. Um, so as you can see, we have one SDA line. So only one of these four devices could be communicating at any given time. Um, and that's what simplex means. You can only communicate in one direction at any point in time. Um, and then this is also has an open drain clock. Um, we'll get into what open drain clock means um, at the end of this presentation, but this is just here so that when you come back after we go over that, um, you'll understand what that means. And the open drain clock also has to do with these pull-up resistors right here that are necessary. Um, and this is used for the, or one example where this is used, it's used in many places on the car, is the TPS 2482 integrated circuits that do the power monitoring on all low voltage uh, boards. So that includes steering wheel, um, which is now dashboard, the APPS, the LV PDB, the data locker, um, and even the accumulator uh, big battery board has a TPS on it to monitor what its low voltage power draw is. Um, yeah, so I guess, is there any questions on that one? I know um, that one was a little bit faster even than the last one. Yeah, I got a question. So you're saying that this is simplex communication, so only one, um, like only one thing can talk, like only like one slave can talk to one master, talk to the master at one time. I'm wondering what happens when like two of them try to talk to the master, like does the message get corrupted or how does that work? Yeah, so you're correct. Only only one thing can be talking at a time. Um, it's sort of like you have a, a talking stick that you pass around. Um, I think the exact implementation has um, a start bit, like a pull, blow, start bit, so that you know when you've started communicating, so nothing else will. Um, but yeah, because so the... The I2C clock is not going all the time because that would take a lot more power. So you can see how at the beginning of this waveform on the bottom left, it's high for a really long time on both. And then it gets pulled low. Um, that indicates the start. So um, the master is the one driving this clock, but like the um, peripheral will be sending this data. So yeah, the master knows when something's transmitting because it's running the clock. The clock won't be run unless something is transmitting. Uh, I'm also curious, so why is this not used um, between PCBs and only within a PCB? Yeah, so um, basically uh, this... This is sort of getting into um, the fact that it's an open drain clock. So if you had your clock going between PCBs, you would need some harnessing, right? Like maybe I have a Duraclick Dura connector on each board, and then I have wires that go over that. Um, when you start adding these really long wire runs, they have a lot of capacitance on them 
um, specifically parasitic acidents, because, um, right, like if I have a wire floating in the air, I could model that as some capacitor to ground, right? It'll have some distance to wherever my ground reference is, and like there'll be air in between, um, right? So everything has some small, sometimes larger amount of capacitance. So when, so open drain, a uh, quick overview, I'll talk more specifically in a couple minutes. You pull it down with a transistor or you let it get naturally pulled up with the pull-up resistor. So you have to wait for the pull-up resistor um, to charge that capacitance, which is gonna be based on like the RC time constant. So if we increase that parasitic capacitance, it will increase that RC time constant and your clock um, may not reach high enough before um, the next clock cycle needs to start. All right. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll move on to the next one then. So SPI or serial peripheral interface is um, basically just another option for communication. Um, this one's full duplex, which means um, you can talk both ways at the same time. So as you can see in this architecture image on the bottom left, we have our um, controller and peripheral devices. So we have a clock pin, which is shared among all of them. And then we have a um, master out master output slave input. So that's coming from the master to both um, slave devices. And then you also have master input slave output. So that's coming from both slave devices to the master. And then you have this one called that's called SS. Um, sometimes this will be labeled as SS. Sometimes it'll be labeled as CS. Um, and what that stands for is chip select. So I2C, I would send the address, right? And then I would send the message. For SPI, I take my chip select and I pull that low. And when I pull that low, now whichever chip I pulled low knows I'm communicating with that chip. So these three main ones are shared among all devices, but chip select, you need one running from the master to each slave device. So you can independently select those. Um, and you pull that low to select the chip. That's why there's a negation bar above it. Um, so normally that's high and then you pull it low when you want to select that chip. And um, this one has a push-pull clock, typically. So uh, like I said with open drain, uh, we'll talk about that. It's like the last slide, I think, in this presentation. But this is here so that when we come back to it, you'll understand what that means. And push-pull clock is significantly faster than an open drain clock. So not only can this go faster because you're both talking to and listening to the same device, um, your clock rate is also going faster. So um, you're switching much more quickly and you don't have to wait for an address to be sent and received um, because you're just pulling this chip select low. So instead of waiting for like an 8-bit address to be sent, all I have to do is wait for this um, this chip select line to get pulled low, and then I can start. Um, so it's significantly faster um, at the cost of more complexity when I am wiring it up. Um, but th that's sort of the basics of this. Um, what, what sort of questions do you guys have on this one? Is there anything on the car that actually needs this full duplex? Um, nothing on our car needs the, like, speed of full duplex. I mean, it's better for, um, 
like I th I think you guys are putting the GPS and the IMU on SPI, right? Um, I'm not really that, sure. Yeah. But... Okay, because that data, typically your IMU and your GPS data is probably the biggest packets you're gonna have on the car. Um, like when I'm just transmitting like what the voltage and current draw of my board is, like that's that's not that much information. Um. But like coordinates and um, like the yaw pitch roll um, three plus the three dimensions of acceleration that the IMU has, like that data starts getting pretty large. So it's nicer to have something that's transmitting more quickly and I don't have to wait for the address. Um, but I2C works like for that as well. Also, um, is the only um, purpose of this chip select versus addressing just so like messages are smaller? Um, so chip select versus addressing will make messages smaller, um, which both improves speed and it also improves your power consumption because I don't have to um, be switching my clock when I am transmitting that address, which um, takes a, quite a hefty amount of power. Um, so, let me, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uses quite a bit of power. Um, so you save a bit of power, you save a bit of time, um, you lose some area on your board. So really, it's it's pros and cons for what you're trying to optimize for. All right. Um, let's move on to the next one, then. So these three are sort of your bread and butter of what communication protocol you would like to select. Um, typically, one of these will meet your requirements pretty well. There's more specific ones if you wanted to uh, like do a specific task, but uh, for PCB communication, after this we'll talk about a couple more, but for inside of my PCB, or maybe like talking between PCB and computer for UART, um, you'd probably pick one of these three. So how do you decide which one you want? Um, well, first, how many devices do you need? If you need more than one-to-one, -one, uh, UART doesn't really meet your needs. If you want, like, five devices, then your wiring is going to get a bit more complicated with chip selects for SPI. But maybe you're trying to get a lot of data from each of those chips, so the speed is just nice. Um, so you, you take on that complexity to have the higher speed. Um, as you can see, like the speeds on here are typically you have UART is 20 kilobits per second. I2C is one megabit per second and SPI is 25 megabits per second. Um, so that's pretty significant change between each of those. Um, one important thing to note here is that I2C and SPI do not have acknowledge pins. So UART will tell you like if you send a UART message, the other device will tell you if it's received it. Um, so that's like always good to make sure that you're actually receiving the message. Like I2C, one of your devices could be transmitting and your uh, controller could never receive it. And then neither side will know what happened. Um, so that's something to watch out for. Uh, and like I said before, SPI will have lower power because um, you don't need to switch the clock during addressing, and you can just pull that low. Um, I'm not sure. They say UART is medium power here. I feel like UART should be lower power. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I2C is like medium power. Um, and you can see UART has like a 15 meter distance, like it can travel pretty far. Um, IPC has a one meter distance. 
and SPI has a 20 centimeter distance, that's because you need to um like drive your clock high and low, um, as well as have the chip select pins go. So both I2C and SBI, you want to minimize trace length because you don't want much capacitance on your lines because it just makes it more slow. Um, oh, and then my other bullet point, I wrote how fast do you actually need to be because um, faster clock is more power. Um, SBI fixes this by turning off the clock when not transmitting. But if you were transmitting a lot and constantly going, um, then like if you had two clocks that were always going and one was at one hertz and one was at uh, two hertz, you would expend more power with the two hertz clock because it's switching more frequently. So it's charging and discharging and you're losing power uh, when you do that. Um, so does anybody have any questions on why would you would pick one versus the other? Yeah, so, um, for purposes for like building a PCB for our car, I mean, I feel like the whole duplex thing, like the duplex advantage that SPI has and like the data speed, it's kind of trivial because there's not that much going on. Like, are there are there really like solid reasons why I want to pick ITC over SPI for any of my devices? Um so for something like the for something like the sensor node, let's say, um ignoring the fact that actually a lot of the sensors on the sensor node are analog um, so you don't actually need digital communication you just read the adcs but let's say for a minute that it was like instead of 10 analog devices you had 10 um, digital communication devices like these um you could use spi so that when i request a sensor's information um, and for example, let's take like the TPS chip, the power monitoring chips, um, data suite. So from the TPS chip, I can ask for things like bus voltage, bus current, bus power. Um, and then it has like a bunch of fault pins. I don't need all of those fault pins, um, and we don't really take bus power because we just take bus current and bus voltage. Um, so with all of that, every time I ask that chip for data, I'm going to ask have to ask for data from some specific register because I don't want all of it. So every time I ask that chip for data, I'm going to have to send a message and then receive a message. So duplex would help you there because as you start sending it, and you're like, I want this information and this information and this information, it can start responding with, okay, here's the first one you asked for, here's the second one you asked for, here's the third one, while I'm still sending like the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. So it can start replying and sending you information at the same time. Um, so if you were only asking for specific bits, uh, it could help you there. But I2C is simpler, it's less wires, um, so sometimes you just want I2C because it's easier to implement. Maybe, maybe it takes less debugging. Um, yeah. Do oh, right. these mm -hmm. like protocols work with all devices? Probably not. Right. Like what? Like what kinds of devices would work best with each? Yeah, so that's actually a good point. Um, a lot of times your bus that you end up picking will probably be dependent on what I see um, you're using because other than a few ICs, typically they only have one communication bus choice. So my my I see will be either 
UR compatible or I2C compatible or SPI compatible. Uh, sometimes they'll have like two out of the three. Um, pretty rare to have like all three out of three. Um, so typically that's actually what ends up determining what you'll pick. Um, it's just what you have availability to because you're going to want the information that this chip has. Um, so you're just going to rely on whatever they say you have to use because um, you have to rely on that designer's work. All right. So moving Wait, on to, oh, one yeah. Question is, oh, I think that'll answer. I was just going to ask about like Canon, if that's like also a protocol, but you have something on that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Quick sneak peek. We're going to talk about ISOSPY, CAN, and then push pull versus open drain clocks. And then we'll open it up just to um, any general questions or just overview questions. All right, so um, quick aside on ISOSPY, which is a, a subdivision of SPI. Um, this is used by the BMS chips that we use from analog devices. Um, right now, those chips are uh, 6811 ICs. Um, I think we're updating them to AD something. Um, they're the ones that got sponsored from the Tesla sponsorship um, that all the FSA teams got. So basically you take your normal SPI bus and then as you can see on the bottom here, it goes through the ISOSPY transceiver and it turns that into a two wire uh, thing that goes through this symbol. And if you haven't seen that symbol before, that's a transformer. It's basically two coils of wire um, wrapped around like an iron or some other ferrous metal core. And you can translate voltage and current across this. So power in is equal to power out. But you could actually have like, if your first coil is two turns around the core, and your second coil is only one turn around the core, you'll have half the voltage on the other side, but twice the current. Um, so your power is the same, but you can transform like the way that it's set up between uh, current and voltage. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, these transformers also take care of the low voltage, high voltage isolation because as you can see in this diagram in the top right, um, these wires are gonna be going into our battery management system. And you can see how they're all daisy chained together. And you don't really want those wires if they got shorted or like broken somewhere and they were touching high voltage. You don't want that to go back into your low voltage controller system. Um, so transformers keep that isolated. Um, so yeah, the, the exact implementation details of this, um, are a bit hard to find, but if you look through the analog devices documentation, they explain it. Um, but this is just an important sub, uh, protocol. That's good to know because we use it for the battery management system. Um, any questions on that? All right, then, um, moving on. All right, here we have the CAN bus, which um, is arguably the most important bus on the car um, because it connects all of the printed circuit boards to each other. So this is a inter-circuit board communication network uh, that goes across the whole car. Uh, so CAN stands for Controller Area Network. And this is a two wire protocol. So you have CAN high and CAN low. 
And the way that this sends information is through differential signals. So if you see on the bottom left, that's how the wire is physically set up. Um, I'll talk about the twisting in a second, but that's how it's physically set up. Everything has access to can high, can low, the same one. And now on the right side, you can see the yellow line is can high and the green line is can low. And when I say differential, I mean that this bus sits at 2.5 volts. And then when I want to um, send a zero, that is a difference, right? So my receiver is going to subtract these two signals. Um, it's a little bit confusing that when there's no difference, it's a one. And then when there is a difference, it's a zero. Um, that's just a implementation detail that is sort of specific to CAN. Because when CAN high is at 3.5 volts and CAN low is at 1.5 volts, that's called a dominant bit. And then when they're both at 2.5 volts, that's called a recessive bit. Um, the reason one is dominant and one is recessive is that when I send, so let's say my bus is empty, it's at 2.5 volts. When, and then let's say we have two boards that want to start transmitting at the same time. They both start by sending their addresses that they're transmitting, like the address of the message. And so the lower address will have priority. And the way you know it's lower is it'll have a zero more early on. So if I transmit like one, or they both transmit like one, one, then the top one does zero and the bottom one does one. Since this one's dominant, it'll pull the bus apart. And my bottom device that was trying to transmit will stop transmitting because it saw something else on the bus use a dominant bit. So it knows that it has priority. So it'll stop transmitting, wait for that message to finish, and then it'll try to send its message again. Um, so also a very important physical implementation detail is over here on the left and the right, you can see at the end of the bus, you have two resistors, or each side has one resistor. And those resistors are 120 ohms. And basically that makes it so that if one board uh, drives can high and can low apart and then stops driving them, the resistor will balance can high and can low back to the same voltage. Right, because if there's no voltage drop across the resistor, there's no current. But if there is a voltage drop across the resistor, there will be a current um, to balance those two voltages. Um, yeah, uh, any questions on that before I go into explaining why we twist it? Okay, so the reason I separated that is um, we'll do another lecture on EMI, maybe like a shorter one. And EMI stands for electromagnetic interference. Um, but real quick, um, a question that's super important that everybody should be able to answer is, well, there's two parts to the question. The first part is, why do we use twisted pairs? And the second part is why do we shield our cables? So let's go over that first one. So when we have two wires and it's differential signal or it's uh, just two signals, um, uh, sort of matters, but for this case, not so much. You twist those two wires together, first of all, because um, on this graph on the right, if we think about if I had a really noisy signal, if both of these wires are right next to each other, they're going to experience the same like noise. Um, noise is random, so we can't really predict it. 
But if we put these two wires next to each other, they'll have the same noise. So if we subtract the two signals, the common mode noise, basically the noise that is common to both of them, should cancel out. Because let's say I had like a really big spike here on this one, but both of them spiked. When I subtract that, the difference is still zero, um, no matter how much noise I had. Um, even when it's like in a dominant bit, if there was a spike up on both of these and I subtract that, you see the same difference in voltage. So putting them close to each other helps with common mode noise rejection. The reason we also twist them is because it helps with um, to reduce magnetic field interference. So when you twist the two cables together, um, you have the surface area of the conductor basically, right? So if I had like two wires, that's some diameter, but if I twist them, you can make it a bit smaller. So reducing that diameter of the conductor will reduce the surface area of the conductor, which if you've taken physics 7b, you'll know that um, if I have a magnetic field, the amount of flux, which is basically like what a magnetic field is, the amount of flux, let's say I have a constant magnetic field, I'll have constant flux. So if I reduce that surface area, the amount of flux going through that area also reduces. So I've reduced the amount of noise by reducing the surface area of my conductor. Um, now, if, if that doesn't make sense at first, um, that's totally fair. Um, but this is a question that uh, we've been asked by judges before. And Ted was like the best person who was able to explain it. And the judges were very impressed by his first order principles of it from a physics perspective. So it's something that we want to make sure everybody knows because first of all, it's like cool to be able to write things to physics, right? It's like, that's like first order principles to the highest degree if you go all the way back to physics. Um, but then also it it's helping with noise reduction or noise mitigation, which is something that's super important. Um, so is there any questions on the magnetic field interference and how we reduce that? Okay. And of course, if, if any questions come up, um, Slack is always open. And like, if you're reading about this later and you're like, wait, what you said didn't make any sense, Andrew, um, that may be plausible. So just send me a message later um, in a public channel so everybody can do the learning together. Um, but yeah, and real quick, the other half of that, that is like, we're, it's electromagnetic interference, right? We talked about the magnetic interference, but what about the electric field, Andrew? Like, why, why didn't you talk about that? So the way we reduce electric field noise is by putting a shield around our conductor. And basically what that means is usually you'll have like a bundle of cables and they're all going through. And then around that, down its entire length, you add a metal sheath. And then you connect that metal sheath to ground um, on like on anywhere, typically like on one end of the cable, you'll connect it to that board's ground. And the reason you connect that to ground is you want to first and foremost reduce the electric field noise. And the way you do that is you've basically created a sheath that has a voltage of zero. So when you have an external electric field, it will um, I would have to go back and check the 7B physics, but basically you've created a sheath, zero voltage. When you have an electric field going all the way around it, now that actually doesn't penetrate because the electrons on the sheath, um, sort of like the electric field points, right? So the positives will go in and the negatives will go out. Um, 
but basically the electric field just gets distributed on that sheath and that sheath is now connected to ground so it just sort of gets absorbed and it doesn't affect like the things inside or it affects them to a less significant degree um so yeah that's sort of the two phases we we twist for to reduce magnetic field noise and then we add a sheath um, or a shield to reduce electric field noise. Um, is there any questions on that now? All right. Um, okay, let's go on to the next one then. So, um, I think this is my, yeah, this is my last slide. And then we'll, I'll show you some resources that I think are good. And then uh, we'll just open it up to questions. Um, so if you'll remember what I said before is that an SPI bus has a push pull clock and an I2C bus has an open drain clock. So um, I'll start with push pull because Inherently, that's typically how people think all clocks work, but that's not actually true. Um, so with a push-pull, uh, let's start with the push phase. Basically, you connect this PMOS on the top to VDD, which uh, for those of you who don't know, VDD is typically um, your upper voltage. That can be like 3.3 volts, that could be 5 volts. Um, those are typically your normal values. So that is connected to five volts and that will pull, or I guess in this case, we're calling it push. That will push it up. Um, the terms push and pull are arbitrary. Like for this, it's called a pull up resistor, but here they're pulling, calling it a pull down. Um, pushing and pulling is, uh, arbitrary terminology. Um, but anyway, you connect this PMOS to VDD and that will bring your output pin up to VDD. And it does that very quickly because you've basically just shorted this and there's very low resistance. Um, something that this diagram that I copied that did not draw on the left side that it did draw on the right side that you should take note is that this V out uh, across the capacitor, that capacitor is um, symbolic, right? Like this trace, our clock trace on the PCB is gonna have some amount of capacitance and that's what determines how fast we can charge or discharge it. So this current source over here will be charging that capacitance. And that's how you bring your voltage up to VDD. And then in your pull phase, um, the PMOS is open and the NMOS is closed and that will sync current from this output and that will bring you down to ground. So that's how you pull yourself up and pull yourself down and then do it over and over. And that's how you make a clock. Um, on the open drain, you can see that we have this resistor. Um, here they wrote it as VCC. Um, that's not, I mean, it, that's fine terminology. VDD and VCC are the same thing. Um, it's always your higher voltage. And then sometimes you'll see ground, like this symbol. Sometimes you'll see GND. And then sometimes you'll see VSS, um, that's for like your lowest voltage. So uh, you have this resistor and this is going to charge your capacitor. So this is where they significantly differ. My open drain is charging through a resistor. So I'm gonna have this signature RC charging waveform, right? But if I charge it with a PMOS, then I'm there's very little resistance. Like this is gonna go up very quickly and then hit my top. Um, and you can see that on the discharge of open drain, 
um, because open drain, I basically open the drain and that drains all the current out of this capacitor. And then it brings my V out down to zero. So you can see that that's very steep, very fast. And so when I do open drain, I have this slow charging that's determined by my pull-up resistance. And then when I go down, it's very steep. Um, Push-pull is steep on both directions. And that's why you can go faster. For this one, I have to wait until I get like over here. Um, I can't really do anything here. Like my rising edge is kind of not very helpful because I, there's a lot of wasted time. If I had like very sharp rising edge and sharp falling edge, like I do on push pull, I can make a much faster clock. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully that makes a good amount of sense. Uh, is there any questions on how that implementation works? All right, and I'll, I'll say again, um, this push-pull uh, versus open drain is a very popular interview question, especially if you're doing something in electrical hardware. So uh, this is a uh, very good stuff to know. Um, so with that, um, these are some additional resources. Um, these are the videos I watched before that gave me the understanding I have now. Uh, and also a lot of the photos in this presentation are taken from these. Um, the, by the way, all the photos in this presentation are in the, um, they're in the like description down here. Um, so a lot of the photos are from the videos. Um, but if any of them are not, and you want to know where they're from, uh, then you can just go into the description and copy that link. Um, yeah. So... Um, I guess any any questions on the presentation in general um, or about any part of that or just other electrical hardware things? What um, what would like a question look like on some of these, like any of your question look like on some of these topics? I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, so like for push, pull, open drain, typically the question is like, can you explain what an open drain versus a push, pull is to me? And then they want you to do something similar to like what I just did to you. Um, just give a general overview with it, explain pros and cons versus each, um, and then sometimes if they want to see if you understand it more deeply, they'll ask probing questions um, about what you explained. Yeah, I mean, some most of the interview questions are basically like, how does this thing work? And then you'd give a little like presentation like I just did about how it works. All right, then, um, if nobody has any additional questions, then um, I will end the recording and uh, we'll stop it there. Bye, recording.